this dear Father God, I'm super nervous, but Lord, um, help me just to, to realize and to remind myself, Lord, that this is not for me, this is not for anyone else, but this is only for you, Lord. Lord, um, take command of my heart, take command of my tongue, Lord, that may everything I say um, at, at this time just be glorifying and completely satisfying to you. Lord, I just um, lift up everything to you no matter what happens, may you just be uh, fully glorified um, at this time. Thank you, Lord, for this in his precious holy name. Okay, um, so I'm going to start my story a little off with, um, I think, one of the most important women in my life, um, and that's my sister, my little sister. Um, she's every bit like your typical little sister, yeah, except that she has this thing called cerebral palsy. Um, it's a condition where, um, because of premature death of her brain cells, um, she's both mentally and physically underdeveloped. Walking and talking are pretty much impossible, and like even eating, which she really enjoyed before, you know, um, is no longer a possibility because she gets fed through a tube through her stomach. Um, and I think often, as I've grown up, you know, um, I've watched uh, her struggle for you know that one more gulp of air, as my parents, you know, just back in after a while, like the ambulance is rushing us to the hospital. Um, a lot of the times, I've truly felt that like, oh, you know, this is it. This is the close call. You know, this is the last of, you know, you know this might be the end of it. And I think, you know, um, just thinking of that, like even now, um, it kind of brings me back to I think the feeling of desperation, of terror, and like just being haunted by like, you know, your imagination. Like, you know, what if this? What if that? And I think I didn't know it at the time, but I. Soon, I think in retrospect, I'm finding out that this fear and uncertainty um, has been my biggest obstacle in my walk with God. Um, you know, sure, you know, I was like your every good Asian Christian boy. You know, I walked through the motions. You know, went to church every Sunday, went through a VBS, uh, vacation Bible school, um, sang all the songs, and I danced to all the motions. You know, um, you know, at retreats, I bawled my eyes out, and I was like, Oh God, I'm gonna give all my life to you, and. You know, I did everything that I had to, you know, in order to preserve and to keep this image, you know, of myself as this model Asian Christian boy, you know, with a good family and like a belief in God. Yet, you know, I I found out that while on the outside everything looked real good and perfect, um, on the inside things were far from it. That there was this, you know, perpetual sense of distrust, a strong foundation of doubt, and a sense of uncertainty that arose from my misplaced conviction that a good God would not bring such misfortune upon my family, that it wasn't possible, you know. Why would this God rob me from the pleasures that so many, you know, of you guys and so many of the people of this world deem as normal, you know? Why would he refuse me my right to grow up together with my sister, you know, to fight over menial things or to even, you know, be that overprotective brother who, like, chases boys away? <laughs> and I think as a result, I grew bitter and I started to draw a line telling God that you are not allowed to come up to this point of my life. This is where it's me, or this is where you've left me, this is where you've left my family, but, you know, giving this condition to my sister. Yet, you know, it's, a lot of people say, you know, all things are good in retrospect, but I think truly, you know, um, throughout college, you know, God has aggressively stepped beyond that line that I've drawn, you know, in a very, very good way, of course. Um, I think, Unlike some people, I don't think I can say that I can point to a specific moment in my life, a single time where I truly, you know, was like felt feeling God's presence and saw specific evidence or some kind of sign that He was working in my life at that moment. Yet I am beyond sure and confident that He has been working, you know, in me, in my life, you know, as a potter works with this clay. And if you look at Isaiah 64, it says, you know, we are the clay, you are the potter, you know, we are all the work of your hand. And I think, you know, Kind of looking back at my life and where my walk with God has been, I find that you know God has shaped me through many things, specifically the relationships that I've made and maintained with people both at Cornell and my first year at Case Western. Um, he shaped me through the experiences that I've had, both ones that I am proud of and both ones that I'm very, very embarrassed of. And all in all, he's taught me what it truly means to be a Christian, not merely in name, but one who desires to be founded more and more upon the Word strengthened further through prayer and being righteous in the eyes of God. And I think while all these lessons I carry with me and are very precious to me, what resonates most is what God has shown me about suffering and its place in the world and in my life. Um, 
So, you know, I was like, you know, how do I conceptualize what my understanding of suffering is? And I think Tim Keller best puts it as he's more eloquent of a speaker and a writer than I am. But, you know, Tim Keller writes that in attempting to understand suffering, we find that God brings fullness of joy, not despite, but through suffering. Just as Jesus saved us in not spite, of, but because of what he suffered on the cross. And so I've come to realize that suffering that I've experienced physically, emotionally, spiritually, you know, while it was painful during the process, it's really helped me to discover God, you know, a God that's not this abstract concept as Mark, you know, eloquently put it. That he's not the God of this world, he's not the God of us as people, but he's God of my life. Who is very real, and very present in who I am today. And that suffering has been a way for God to teach me and show me what it means to pursue and seek His will. And while it hasn't been an easy journey, um, I can now look back and say I'm reminded on a daily basis of His lessons, of what He's taught me, and that through my sister and her condition, um, I've learned to grow to be thankful, not resentful. And sorry, that was a lot of stuff I just like spit at you. Um, but I'd like to leave you with some small words of hopefully sound advice and encouragement, um, and this is in no particular order. One, love the people around you. Um, treasure the relationships that you've made and that you will make. As brothers and sisters of Christ at Cornell at College, you know, we are so privileged and blessed to have a community that is with us in our victories and in our defeats. Two, above all, love God. In your highs and lows, do not take lightly what it means to be a Christian because it will never be a walk in the park in all fun and games. It will be tough that you will have to make sacrifices. So take to heart what it means for you to define yourself as a Christian. And last but not least, have hope. Hope not in the things of this world, but in God and God alone. Have hope that uh, we as Christians you know, may suffer. Um, so to my small group of people who are there, this is similar to what I shared before, but sorry. I hope you guys are as encouraged as the, hopefully it was before, but, um, you know, we Christians suffer not because we like pain and hardship and that we're masochists and we like to hurt ourselves, but because we have an understanding and trust that there are greater things to come, you know, that there are treasures in heaven that we store up and not treasures on earth. And I think in the past month, um, there has been a song lyric and a verse that have been very kind of central and crucial in my evaluation of my walk with God, and I wanted to share them with you. And the first song is um, Your Grace is Sufficient. I really like the Shane and Shane version, but um, that's just the minor thing. Um, so it says, you know, your grace is sufficient. Um, your strength is made perfect when I am weak. All that I cling to, I lay at your feet. And your grace is sufficient for me. And I think a lot of the times we sing the lyrics in our words and into our songs, um, not realizing the magnitude of the weight that it carries on our lives, you know? Um, and I really want to encourage you guys, you know, as you read through the Bible and as you listen, to, as you sing through the Psalms, ask yourself, what does it mean to have God's grace as being solely sufficient? What does it mean to let go of the things that you're clinging to? You know, what does it mean to be fully and wholly dependent on God? And I think to end on a more hopeful and encouraging note, um, Paul writes in 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 9, um, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And like Paul says, you know, all of my brothers and sisters, you know, you know, AIV or not, um, although you know, we may or may not see each other again, um, I hope and I have hope that I will see you at this finish line. All of us with our crowns of righteousness in hand. So don't give up, have hope, and keep on fighting the good.